y'all are in for a treat. Ms. Sylvia Hurtado is professor and director of the Higher Education Research Institute at UCLA in the Graduate School of Education and Information Science. Just prior to coming to UCLA, she served as director of the Center for the Study of Higher and Post-Secondary Education at the University of Michigan. Dr. Hurtado has published numerous articles and books related to her primary interest in student educational outcomes, campus climate, college impact, and student development, and diversity in higher education. She has served on numerous editorial boards for journals in education and served on the board for the American Association of Higher Education, the Higher Learning Commission, and in past, as a past president of the Association for the Study of Higher Education. Black Issues in Higher Education named her among the top 15 influential faculty whose work has had an impact on the academy. And this is top 15 people in the nation, maybe the world, right? She obtained her PhD in education from UCLA and an EDM from Harvard Graduate School of Education and a bachelor's from Princeton University in sociology. Please join me, ladies and gentlemen, for a warm welcome, a robust, enthusiastic, <laughs> stomp your feet, feel good. <laughs> Round of applause for Ms. Sylvia Hurtado. <laughs> it's wonderful. Uh, I'm so happy to be here because um, every summer at the Higher Education Research Institute, we offer institutes. And when I first arrived there, I said, more and more campuses need to know about the research that's going to further their practice and increase uh, their, uh, their efforts toward institutional transformation. So we hold something called the Diversity Research Institute. Well, by the second year that we offered it, we had probably about 10 people from Wisconsin come. And I said, hmm, that's interesting. This is a fairly new uh, kind of uh, institute, and we were really pleased. A couple of years later, that number from Wisconsin doubled. So of course, that opened my eyes, and I said, something's going on there. So this is the Wisconsin way, I suppose, because this is wonderful to have um, so many people engaged to really think about the issues, and I think both the Institute and what I hope that today i be able to provide a little bit of information so that everybody's on the same page as they're moving forward. And I think that's key. But I want to say that I think uh, I see a lot of institutions. In fact, next week I'm going to do uh, some data collection and look at the climate at a particular institution. They are consistent racial incidents, sexual assaults that are happening across the country, and campuses are coming back to try to understand what to do. This happens periodically, and unless you're proactive, you're always going to be re reactive. So I see this room filled of very proactive people, and so that gives me great hope. Let me start with a little bit, and I think probably you've had great in-depth conversations about diversity, what it means, what it looks like. Um, and uh, today, I'm not going to talk as much about institutional transformation, though I can answer some of those questions. But because of the focus on educational achievement and what we hope for our graduates, that's actually one of my loves. I actually do a lot of work in STEM. I've been doing work for the last nine years in STEM disciplines. I'm happy to answer questions at the end related to that if you're particularly interested in that. But today, I'm really going to talk about uh, more generally diversity and also what it looks like within the college environment. So let me start with what do we mean by diversity? Uh, I'm going to start with an uh, area where we are advancing in higher education in terms of thinking about this. When we first began to deal with diversity, obviously, it was really, uh, it's researchers began to try to uh, study the impact of black enrollment. What, how do institutions change? Now, actually, post-affirmative uh, post action cases, et cetera, we are now adopting a multiple identity perspective on all campuses to really think about inclusion. And also, there's actually the same patterns of marginality that permeate many groups, everything from women in STEM to sexual orientation to religion to all these other areas. So diversity is now more broadly defined on college campuses. At the same time, we still need to continue to acknowledge the needs of distinct populations because we have not achieved the equity we hope to achieve. Second thing, when we talk about diversity, sometimes we're referring to different modes about learning about diversity. Diversity in the faculty, diversity in the curriculum. Really, we're thinking about broad range of initiatives, curricular, co-curricular, and sometimes we're referring to human resources. 
So we need to begin, and I love to see your concurrent sessions because I can see how you're addressing diversity in all kinds of uh, these dimensions. The final point I want to just say in terms of thinking about diversity is diversity is a resource. It's not the problem. Inequity is the problem. And I think that's the transition we've made in our thinking in terms of really thinking about, well, when is it an asset? How is it an asset? When you get a group of people that as diverse as this room is, uh, surprising to me for Wisconsin, but I really see a great deal of diversity. Because <laughs> I come from LA, you can't bump into somebody who's going to speak another language or be from another religion or another racial ethnic background. But um, really, that's the asset. I'm going to show you a little bit of research that actually confirms that. We've done this. There's a lot of, there's now at least two decades of research, but more recent research. And we need to focus on both the equity and diversity component. It's great to say, yes, educational benefits of diversity, let's focus on that. But we also have to attend to the equity goals. OK? So let me start with a framework that I developed uh, with some colleagues um, about the climate. Because I, I also felt, felt that people were, were not grasping the climate. They didn't know exactly what that meant. You know, Did it mean wasn't the temperature, what was going on? Uh, and so I needed to really give a little bit more focus to that. So I started with four dimensions, pulling from all the literature and the research on different racial ethnic groups and what we knew, um, and really came up with these four dimensions. The historical legacy of inclusion exclusion, which means there could be some resistance, there could be embedded in your mission, it could be, uh, it could be actually, you know, we've had at least 18 states that had desegregated, that actually had segregated, rather segregated higher education systems. So the historical legacy is still somehow there and we have to really think about that's really embedded sometimes in the culture of campus. Compositional diversity refers to the numbers. And in higher ed, we're always talking about the numbers, but we're also talking about representation. Who's at the table? Diverse students, and we're always talking about and diversifying the faculty and staff. So the numbers are very important because they provide the opportunity for two other dimensions. One is the behavioral dimension for interactions to occur, and that's where we're seeing the link with the benefits of diversity, and I'm going to show some research related to that. But really, the more diverse you have people and represented and hearing their voice and sharing their perspectives, we really find that interaction is key. So we can bring diverse people together, but unless they interact, we're not going to have the benefits of diversity. Then, of course, the psychological dimension. How do people feel welcomed? Do they feel like they belong? Do they perceive tension? Do they perceive discrimination, microaggressions? Or are there some abort forms of prejudice that still exist? And sometimes we see this in terms of some of the racial incidents. There's also an organizational dimension. I'm going to spend as much time talking about this because there's actually less research on the specific budget allocation, policies, or decision making. There's more work to be done in that. But we know all of those are tied because they structure, really, the curricular and co-curricular spheres where people interact. But also diversity in the curriculum, there's actually quite a bit of research. And I'm going to present just a little bit today on that. Um, but before I go there, I want to go back to the climate. Now, how many people, how many, what percentage of students do you think actually report an incident uh, of discrimination to a campus authority? Just a guess. 63? People? <laughs> Here's some. Okay, nationally, only about 10 or 11 percent of college students will report an actual incident to a campus authority. So when a campus president asks me to come and look at the climate, he says, Sylvia, is this the tip of the iceberg, or am I just seeing some very unusual cases? And I just say, well, let's, I can answer that empirically. So, OK, so this is for, comes from our diverse learning environment survey. We developed this uh, a few years ago so that more campuses can compare themselves on the climate. This is the percentage of students who report an incident of discrimination that they did. These are for the underrepresented groups. Remember I said for all students it was about 11%. So we see it's higher for underrepresented groups, particularly African-American students. And the less diverse the campus, the more frequent those reports are. OK, so that's a pattern. So it was like, OK, we know this. 
Then let's, let's look more carefully at what we call microaggressions, those more subtle things. Now, these incidents usually are punishable by law. Sometimes they include harassment, threats. Uh, sometimes we, can in student, uh, we have student codes to protect that, uh, students and really regulate some civil behavior. And we have, we have disciplinary means to deal with those actual incidents. We don't for the more subtle kinds of issues that happen. So we ask students a whole range of questions. I'm going to use one, one of the slides. Type of discrimination experience. Experiencing exclusion of some type. How frequently? The number goes up. So more students are going to be experiencing this. And also, the, more, the less diverse the campus, the more likely that you're going to have these incidents and microaggressions. Again. Individuals are not used to interacting with each other. There's no template for this. And so we're actually uh, building that, what real integration looks like in terms of interaction that creates diverse outcomes. So having done a lot of work on the climate, I thought, well, uh, we need to, one of the things that bothered me about the first kind of model was that was great. Now we have a language to talk about some of these things. We can look at it in different dimensions. We can study this. We can actually uh, examine our own behavior on some of these issues. But it's not linked with educational outcomes. So the next work that I did really focused on understanding the link. And actually, the earliest work that we did in acting diverse learning environments, that actually really uh, summarized the work up to that point, up to uh, about 2000, that linked it with outcomes. So moving further now, most of the work that's happened since then has been a tremendous amount of work on linking it with educational outcomes. So here's the new model that I have uh, put forward. And there's a couple of dimensions to this. It might be hard to see. You can see the overall model. But at the center is the institution that is influenced by the social historical context, the policy context. That varies from state to state. The institutional context. And then the climate for diversity informs the co-curricular and curricular spheres at the center. Okay, So the climate then, my theory is that basically it's informed by larger social historical forces, but also informs the context in which students are educated. Okay? So there are the four, now the five dimensions are still influencing. And now I'm really looking at the relationship between students, faculty, and staff, and that dynamic and what happens in that. At the center of the model is student identity. The range, race, class, uh, ability, the needs of students, low income, uh, sexual orientation, religion, differences, knowing more about our students, I think, is central to this model. Of course, also what's important is faculty identity and staff identity. Without knowing it, we actually perform our identities in classrooms and in interactions with others. So I think it's great that we started with, uh, with uh, uh, kind of theatrical um, demonstration, because I think we actually are performing our identities every day, right? And students are too, though they don't know the net connection with some of the larger groups. Or some of them really are very much strongly identified. Their fate is shared with particular groups that we have to acknowledge. I think the important part of the model is really the link with outcomes. And I'm going to put three here, because I designed the model, and I can put whatever I want in it. <laughs> but my favorites are the, these. I call it habits of mind and skills for lifelong learning. You know, every time I hear or talk with a science professor, we have to cover the content, the content, the content. That's wonderful, but we'll never be able to cover all the content that our students need to master to be lifelong learners or to even be specialized in a particular career. So we have to give them the skills to be lifelong learners. Everything, training them from asking questions to evaluating sources of information, these are all the skills of a good liberal education, critical thinking. Competence, competencies for a multicultural world. Now, uh, employers, I'm going to show a measure we have related to one of these measures that, and the outcomes. Employers are saying, yes, we need to have students who can write, who are critical thinkers, but we also have to have them skilled in communication, managing, negotiating difference, working with a diverse workforce. That's absolutely essential. So I think those competencies, we have to give a little more thought to in how we're actually producing them. And of course, retention and achievement. We want them to uh, 
get their degrees and go on and be qualified for all the uh, wonderful things that they're aspiring to become. And then the final part of the model is that that last arrow pointing down is really society. I thought we need to really think about we're producing graduates for society we cannot envision today. That's very different. We want them to know everything from the classic theory to uh, all the Im important works the world has known, et cetera. But we have to also prepare them for a society we can't even imagine, but we aspire for, right? So what's that society? More equitable, more democratic, and of course, uh, economically sustainable, all right? So when we think of those three goals, we actually are, have a vision of society we may not realize today or we're working towards or looking forward to. But that's the hope of our world as educators as we're really producing people who are going to vision, uh, revision things that we could never experience. Even a few years ago, we could not imagine the internet, right? Now we can't imagine life without it. So these are the kinds of things. We want students to be visionary, and we all want them to be good citizens. OK, so what does it mean to place students' identity at the center of a model or of practice? It means knowing our students, their cultural histories, needs, whether that's financial, academic, or other constraints they may be under. There are some campuses that are also thinking about not only advising, but we actually need to have caseworkers work with student cases. This is happening more broad access institutions, community colleges, for example. They're realizing the way they've done things in the past is not acknowledging the whole range of constraints that some students face. When you put student identity in the center, you begin to really think about your practices to accommodate students' academic, cultural, psychosocial, and yes, spiritual development. All those dimensions are very important. I think I'm really touching the cores of student affairs workers here because student development is key. The other notion that we think about, instead of survival of the fittest, our notion is one of talent development, taking students from where they begin to the next level, whatever that might be. So when you think about it in that way, we're actually doing some of this work with uh, retention in students, and we're looking at those institutions that have graduation rates below 50%, those that are above, and actually the difference between their actual uh, and their expected for low income, first generation, different underrepresented groups. To see institutions that are really moving the bar, that they take the students with, they take the students they have, and they actually are moving the bar and actually exceeding expectations for completion to find out what kind of practices are in place at those campuses. And one of the things that's real important about thinking about is that every campus can succeed. There's no one kind of metric, though state legislators or you know, federal government have a different <laughs> metric. But really thinking about moving students from uh, beyond what we would expect for their ability, their income, et cetera, is very, very key. So that's why I think we need to really think about uh, really our practices. And one of the things that I think is key is each of us can be an institutional agent to help students navigate college. Um, and for, for low income first generation students, it's very important because they rely on others when they come to campus to help navigate and understand. If they don't have a college educated parent or relative, they really rely on you to really understand the cues um, and actually how to, how to navigate. Finally, the climate issues, stereotyping, finance, they still play a role even with high achieving students and middle income students. We're seeing that effect. Okay, so let's look at the processes at the center of interaction and then I'm gonna get into some data. What are the processes? One is a typical model has been socialization we are socializing students to be citizens, to be um, uh, to the particular professions they're choosing to be in, uh, to be college students. But I also want to think about that socialization and turn it on its head a bit. It's more of a mutual learning among students and peers and also with faculty and staff in terms of their identities and administrators. We are learning from them. And every time, actually, I present something in the classroom, 
and I hear a different take. I'm learning from the students, and we never record that mutual learning piece that's coming back to, as a feedback loop in what we do. Very important. Another important concept, Laura Rendon actually worked with um, first generation, low income, and community college students. This notion of validation, academic validation in the classroom. She defines it as an ena enabling, confirming, and supportive process initiated by in and out of class agents that foster academic and interpersonal development. And I'm gonna show you actually some measures, I'm so excited, because we took the qualitative work and now we have some quantitative measures of that and we're using some of our surveys. And then of course, one area that I've worked on for a lot, long time is sense of belonging. Is the students get cues in terms of accessibility to faculty, they get cues from peers about whether or not they belong here. And we have to have inclusive practices to engender this psychological sense of community. Now, everybody's familiar with the Tenter model, right, in terms of integration. Well, one of the things that most researchers forgot in that model to even test was he actually talked about more of kind of psychological sense of feeling part of that campus that actually leads to retention can be initiated by all these involvements. Now let me stop because we're, every campus is into involvement, big ways, involvement, engagement, that's the, the buzzword, right? Well, but not all involvements produce the same level of sense of belonging, right? There's variation. Some students are more responsive, for example, to religious communities. Some of them are responsive to uh, working together in terms of one of the things that, I'm gonna use my STEM example, academic clubs in organizations, student organizations. That has a huge effect on retention because, not just because it's engagement, it creates that psychological sense of belonging. All right, let's look at academic validation in the classroom. These are the measures, maybe you can see them or not, I'll read them off, a couple of them off really quickly. This is, faculty provided me with feedback that helped me assess my progress in class. Lots of times we think about assessment as reporting to others, not really giving feedback to students. My contributions were valued in class. Instructors encouraged me to meet with them after or outside. Faculty showed a concern for my progress. Faculty encouraged me to ask questions and participate in discussions. All right, so it's like, oh well, let's see what the results are. So we look at students in the first year of college, and by the way, what we find is just the simple thing of asking questions drops from high school to college. So we're almost like shutting down inquiry in our introductory classes instead of increasing it. All right, so let's look at the academic valid validation. The end of the first year, these are the different groups. This is the scale, and it's the mean is the, the, uh, the uh, pyramid there. And so you know there's variability, a lot more variability on students who say, I'm not coming back the second year. They've already decided by the end of the year they're not coming back. Our answer are, they're answering our survey, surprisingly, but they've already decided they're not coming back. It's like usually the worst. They won't answer our survey and they'll come back, but anyway. There's less variability in that feeling of academic validation among students who decide to stay retained. The one group that's a little bit different is retention is high, but they feel a low sense of academic validation, and that's among Asian American students. So we're really seeing a little different kind of pattern for that particular group of students. That's why student identity is so important. Some things work differently and we have to understand why. Well, let's look at academic validation in relation to, to diversity of the faculty. We took the proportion of uh, underrepresented faculty in our institutions to look at, was academic validation higher in some institutions? Yes. It was higher in some institutions that had a more diverse faculty. So this is a link between student identity and faculty identity. Now, of course, very crude measure, looking at that in more specifically in terms of how it works out and in dynamics is very key. But we also know there's differences in terms of faculty, in terms of their goals for undergraduate education. This comes from our national faculty survey, which we're actually launching this year um, for, with lots of great stuff in it. <laughs> but the, one of the key differences, enhancing students' knowledge and appreciation of different racial ethnic groups seems to be high among underrepresented faculty. Now we have to do more analysis to look at the differences between fields, et cetera, but we see that. Now one area where it's low for, for both groups, I think, um, is engaging students in civil discourse among controversial issues. 
We don't, try, we don't train faculty how to handle conflict in the classroom, particularly when it results with diversity. And some campuses are doing dialogue groups. They're also doing some faculty development to really enhance this. But if really we expect them to be citizens and to have civil discourse, God knows we need it because you can just turn the TV on and really see that we do need some civil discourse in this country, is that we really have to learn how to do it ourselves if we expect students to do it. So what's the difference between, or what's the relationship between a diverse content and academic validation in the classroom? Well, we know that Canvas, these are the numbers of courses that students took. This is the Diverse Learning Environment Survey. If they took a course that addressed materials and readings about privilege and oppression, it was, it was pretty high and increased with every course they took. Uh, if they took materials and readings, uh, any course they reported had materials and readings about race, ethnicity, um, it would increase, or readings about gender. So we knew that content makes a difference. Now, of course, if they had a lot of courses, they actually feel very validated. They continue to take them, but probably majors. These are some controls we need to really think about. Now, what about general interpersonal validation, which is another measure, which includes really staff. Most of what we do really excludes staff uh, in terms of understanding those interactions. And we wanted to, in this particular survey, really connect that with practice. So uh, here's a few additional staff questions. At least one staff member has taken interest in my development. Staff recognize my achievements. So similar pattern with retention. So every single one of us can actually contribute to this retention to not only feel, increase students' validation, they belong here, um, but also increase their retention. So now I want to turn to one of my other favorite outcomes, and that's civic learning. Remember I talked about the multicultural competencies. I'm just going to go an overview of this. We've presented this um, in a number of places. And um, Diversity and Democracy, which is a newsletter from AAC, say, and you actually produced a, a, a snippet from all this research. But we looked at 19 outcomes that constituted civic learning according to how AAC and you uh, outlined this. So the reliability is there. I'm going to look into a few of these. But first of all, I want to say across the 19 outcomes on our surveys. Now, all of this was longitudinal. But we looked at first year, the end of first, beginning to the end of first year, the end of beginning to fourth year, to understand those in the 19 model. So we controlled for how students entered in terms of some of their assessments. The key results we found in terms of number and direction of significant relationships, remember these were 19 civic learning outcomes. 18 of them were positively related to students' cross-racial interactions on campus. In terms of that cognitive measure I started talking about, habits of mind for lifelong learning, were students doing these specific things, revising papers, asking questions, evaluating the kind of information they received, related to 18 of the civic outcomes. Sense of belonging was related to 10 of the 19 outcomes. Volunteer work, which is a lot of work that is done across campuses that are engaged in civic learning, it was related to 12 of the 19. Leadership training, 11 of the 19. Now, we expect we've been doing these for a very long time. Yes, we are contributing to citizenship in different ways, depending on how you measure it. One interesting one that emerged, the extent to which students felt that the institution had respect for expression of diverse beliefs, 11 out of the 19 outcomes. And of course, service learning course was related to 10 of the 19 civic learning outcomes. And negative to one, and I'll just mention that, it was actually voting. That is, students really are disaffected with the political situation. And they're choosing to express their citizenships in unique ways, and the service learning has actually given them an opportunity to do that. Not unsurprising. So let's take a look at pluralistic orientation. Now, I hope that I'm conveying that academic achievement and learning is related to civic learning. And the third part of that stool is diversity. Those are all linked with each other. That's what all these different points of data are showing. Let's take one of my favorite measures, pluralistic orientation scale. We now have it on all of our surveys from entering students. We even have a 10-year follow-up on some of our students, and we have that. This came from employer surveys. We took directly off employer surveys in terms of some of the skills they wanted workers to have in the 21st century. Tolerance of others with different beliefs. Ability to work cooperatively with diverse people. 
open us to having my own muse challenge. By the way, that's usually the lowest in terms of percentage of freshmen who say they, they are open to that, and actually lowest among seniors in terms of all of these measures. People are pretty confident, yeah, I can work with diverse people, even if they haven't had any experience. But ask them about their opinion and willingness to be challenged, that takes a little more work. And we, but we can see changes in that area. Ability to discuss controversial issues, and of course one of my favorites is perspective taking, the ability to see the world from someone else's perspective. Not sympathize with them, but empathize, right? Try to train students the difference between those. So let's look at course content, diversity in content. Now this actually relates to pedagogy. I'm looking at service learning, materials and readings about race, ethnicity, and also an important one, opportunities for intensive dialogue with students from different backgrounds in the classroom. The more courses they take, the more likely score, they score higher on pluralistic orientation scales. All right, so that's one of my favorites. But let's take a look at uh, in a multivariate context. That is, we took our, there's about 27,000 students in the first year across a number of colleges. The key predictors, over and above, unique predictors to the outcome in terms of change, that is, we assess them at first year, the end of the first year. Again, informal kinds of things that students do, interactions with diverse peers, taking action on racial issues, and then, interesting enough, hours working for pay, which kind of validates the measure. It's sort of uh, ability to work with people who are diverse in terms of the outcome. Hours spent studying and hours spent socializing. Certain students are more social. They're going to be able to get along with just any group. But really, we're controlling for all of that and over and above. What are the campus facilitated things that we're doing relates to that? Leadership training, diversity co-curricular activities. We ask a whole series of events, and if they use these different centers, cultural centers, et cetera. Diversity courses, service learning and community service, and course opportunities for intensive dialogue produce change in the first year on this outcome. There's a lot of things we're doing that's related to diversity. And at first, we may not think so, but actually does relate and prepares them for a diverse world. Finally, let me go a little bit further. Since 1966, we've had this measure, what we've called social agency. And these are students' values, their value. How important is them to them personally? We ask this at freshman year, fourth year, and we've even done 10-year follow-ups of students. How important is them to influence social values? to promote racial understanding, influence the political structure, and help others who are in difficulty. We monitor these trends across freshmen for many years, and of course, anytime there's an, a serious world event, a flood, an earthquake, a terrorist attack, helping others in difficulty rises. So we have period effects that affect this. But outside of the larger social historical framework, what works in college? College experiences that predict social agency include in the informal, again, positive interaction with diverse peers, and by the way, also negative interactions with diverse peers. That means they learn to really think about how I'm going to change the world even in their negative experiences. This begins to switch our, our mindset a little bit in that there's areas of resistance. When you're told you're not welcome in the neighborhood, you're not welcome here, some students say, I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to do it. Not everyone responds that way. So really, we have to be attentive to that response. Voting in a student election and also these uh, social agency change from first year to fourth year in college in terms of also understanding of others and self-understanding that relationship is there and academic ability. Campus facilitated programs and opportunities, again, perform community service as part of class, attending a racial cultural awareness workshop, and taking ethnic or women's studies, also inputs. So what does that mean? That means we are responsible for creating the conditions for student success. Remember the original model? We're preparing them for a society we cannot imagine, for the society we aspire to become. That's what's so exciting about our jobs because that's what we're doing. The phenomenon of underrepresentation continues. Yes, we're still dealing with the numbers. And 
the, um, all of what I call the intersubjectivities, all the kinds of dynamics that occur as a result of being underrepresented, isolation, and we also see very low engagement. So practices that improve the climate for those most underrepresented groups, Latinos, African Americans, Native Americans, different fields, as is assessment of the climate is absolutely essential. And I think that's one of the things that I really teach at the Diversity Research Institute. Knowing more about our students and their interactions are very key. Also, faculty diversity, I hope that is a point that came away from this, and diversity in the curriculum. There are solutions to addressing underrepresentation and advancing the learning about diversity. Many times we hear about students who, became, who actually bear the burden of educating others. They are the responsible person in the classroom to answer for their group, and students of color are tired of this. So that means we have to do better training of faculty, and we also have to have ways of having those conversations in classrooms so that it becomes a more mutual learning environment and not a one-way learning environment. And finally, I want to say that students can't learn about diversity in the abstract. I mean, they can understand it. For example, we did a climate study, and I asked white students, you know, what's your experience with discrimination? And they said, a student actually said, I have this in a report that went back to the campus. I know it exists, but I've never seen it. So it's abstract, right? They heard about it. When you have opportunity to share personal stories, to really understand that. It really brings things home, both the abstract to understand, yes, there is privilege, there is discrimination. All of that exists in our college environment, and we're dealing with it on a daily basis, though we want to ignore or make these things invisible. But really, I think the peer learning environment is actually essential to that as well. So uh, that combination is very key. All right, so I'm going to just give you some resources, and I'm I'll be open to questions, and it could be just about anything. Uh, it's my favorite thing to do. Um, but um, the model, if you want to go into the detail of all the research behind the model, uh, the model is called uh, for diverse learning environments, a scholarship in creating and assessing conditions for student success. We bring in a lot of work, and in fact, it's my first foray in bringing in uh, some uh, gender studies uh, material, as well as we have. Uh, uh, a whole range of different kind of uh, what I call social identity-based uh, literature that I brought in to understand that, that, that whole model and how it might work. Okay, I'm open. Is someone helping to coordinate the questions here? Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You have, you have to give me a signal on how much time. Uh, are the microphones available for people? Yeah, there's a mic here. Mm. Oh, there. It's on PowerPoint, and I sent it to the office of uh, the, uh, the division, so it, it's available. And I encourage them to put it on the website. Question over here. Hi. Okay. Um, my name is Will Clifton. I'm from the Office for Equity and Diversity Learning Communities. Mm -hmm. uh, you just make me want to holler. I, <laughs> everything that you just shared. Thank uh, you. And, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, could you speak to um, the work and the impact of intergroup dialogues? Mm -hmm. I really like to hear your thoughts on that oh, and share. Well, this is a person after my own heart, obviously, a dialogue. Um, let me just say that I, um, when I went to the University of Michigan, they're the campus that have done, they've, they've got the model, actually. They've been doing this for many years, and there's a new book, Dialogues Across Differences. My colleague, uh, former colleague there, Pat Curran, is the lead author on that. Um, and uh, they actually uh, have done this. They tried the same curricular model at eight institutions and did a quasi-experimental design and saw lots of important, there's great data on this. Um, when I got to UCLA, there were three other faculty members teaching diversity courses in the School of Ed, and I thought, well, why do we need to keep offering? I said, I'm changing my course to a dialogue course, which was a little bit of a risk, and let me just say why, is that in dialogue, you don't know what's gonna happen. 
when students start talking about issues. You don't know. So there's three principles that I learned. One of the, what I think the stars in dialogue is Jimena Zuniga, who's at UMass Amherst. If you ever get a chance to bring her, you should, particularly for faculty development. Um, she loves conflict. She'll say, soon as someone says something that's crazy, she says, now we have something to learn, rather than avoiding it, basically. I had to learn from her. And I learned that whatever transpired, we were going to go with it. And we were going to take it and inform each other. And this would be a real mutual learning environment. What does that mean for me as an instructor? I had to be a, facil a true facilitator of conversation. Right? So that's really hard when you're used to controlling, right? when you have the opposite, that you know, you're you know, the filling the vessel. No, all of us on these vessels were going to be filling me. <laughs> and we were doing this dynamic. So it was really exciting, but also scary. I don't know if anybody, everybody can do it or do it well. But I, have to, I had to, when I moved from, I was a graduate student at UCLA, and I went to University of Michigan for my first academic career, was there for 12 years. I immediately saw the value. I said, not only can students uh, talk about issues in the abstract of what it means. Um, they actually can relate stories to their own lives to make it real in the classroom. So immediately I said, there are, all of you have something, again, getting to the idea of validation, something to contribute, and we're all going to learn from it, right? And so, of course, you have all the theory, you have all the, you know, I had a long lesson plan, a minute by minute lesson plan. Let me tell you, my facilitator and I, we were like, we, were, we do co-facilitation. So it was a graduate student who actually had done conflict management, actually, in the legal world. And so here was a conflict management person, and here was a dialogue person, and we were using the same skills to communication, cross-cultural communication, which you're going to have a fabulous speaker, by the way, this afternoon on that, cross-cultural issues. Um, but anyway. Uh, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been a real journey. And what was wonderful about it is every time I have that class, I learn something new from the students. But there were two things that I had to do as an instructor, and anyone who's going to these dialogues, is there's a lot of hurt out there regarding identity issues. And these come up from childhood through Last week, basically, uh, you, their experiences. And it really is educational to really hear about them. And um, so, OK, so I had to develop comfort with emotion, and I had to make the class comfortable with emotion. We're not trained to do that. We do everything. We want to avoid conflict and emotion. The other was conflict. So it got to the point that if it wasn't, OK, students' valuations for my class, are different from any other faculty member. They'll say, there wasn't enough conflict in this class. It's like, that was like the downside of it. It's like, we, all, we agreed too much. We were ready to get into it, right? And a part of it is really establishing, you do everything from active listening to um, establishing notions or understandings that we're all socialized by our families, by our churches, by the media, and how do we undo some of that socialization to open up pathways to understanding? So key concepts, there are always key concepts that we give students tools. One of the most powerful tools, and this is something that goes back to the habits of mind for lifelong learning, that can be used in dialogue, asking questions. It's a great, you can de-escalate, sometimes escalate, uh, <laughs> Conflict, but you can de-escalate conflict very easily by asking clarifying questions. So we give students a list of seven types of questions they can ask. And we say, you're also in charge of the dynamics of this discussion. Every person has to step in, step up, or step back, right? So anyway, it's, it's been a real journey. And I think I really uh, feel that those who are the pioneers in this area are doing just amazing things with students. And those students are coming out of there. Now we have the research evidence with strong communication skills. 
the ability to work in very dynamic environments that are diverse. And that really is one of our key goals. Another question. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, my name is Gabe Javier. I serve as the director of the LGBT Campus Center here mm -hmm. at UW-Madison. Um, and they're really connected with your comments about um, engendering a self of uh, belonging, um, faculty readiness or not readiness to mm -hmm. handle conflict mm -hmm. in the classroom regarding um, diversity. Could you talk a little bit about the things that you found that were important regarding um, encouraging diverse learning environments uh, between the differences and similarities between race and ethnicity and sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think the, the principles are similar in one respect, contact. Having contact with someone who's different from the various communities and bringing them together has a huge effect. There are several articles uh, that we've written on sexual orientation and the diversity uh, and race ethnicity, and we're seeing the same kinds of things. Having contact from someone from those communities actually begins to change undergraduates' views about the world and uh, creates greater understanding. So I think that, again, that goes back to Gordon Alport, but we also have to have um, what I call safe spaces and brave spaces. The safe spaces are the ones we typically know is that when, where groups can congregate to say, uh, where they feel a sense of relief, where they can feel less isolation, where they feel they can share uh, and get resources for their goals and aspirations and not feel like they're under some kind of uh, cultural trauma or assault. So those are safe spaces. The brave spaces are crossing across those lines for people to share things so that you can have what results out of that contact is real learning. And I think, again, if you believe that diversity has an impact on outcomes, which some people are, it really is through that contact and that exchange and creating the conditions for that to occur. And that's where I think we're, our work is really moving far beyond the numbers. We're really working on that level now, whether there's contact between peers or faculty and students. We're really beginning to unpack those dimensions where many other researchers, some of you very esteemed researchers here at Wisconsin are working on those issues. And I think um, there are some similar patterns, but there are also unique uh, problems to each community we can't ignore. And that's why we have to have both the safe spaces and the brave spaces. Hello. Yes. Hi, I'm Valencia Raphael. I'm a JD PhD student here in the education um, leadership and law school. Um, so I'm in one of these diversity classes that you were just speaking about. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we've kind of had a lot of momentum. We were talking about some of the seminal works in diversity in education. And we're starting to kind of lose inertia as we try to problem solve on how we, mm -hmm. um, as graduate students and kind of like the next wave of leaders really solve these problems. And I feel like the tipping point was kind of when we talked about white privilege and kind of have different viewpoints on what students are supposed to do with their white privilege. And I just wanted to know if you can talk about how we can transform um, this idea of privilege into kind of a shared responsibility and motivation to problem solve instead of just placing a lot of responsibility on um, underrepresented minorities yeah. um, to, to fix things. Yeah. Thank you for that question, because I think that gets back to the mutual learning, thinking about creating the mutual learning environment. And um, I think uh, we actually, in our dialogue, we get to a point where, um, and it happens in many classes, where white students feel guilty. That's a totally unproductive outcome. <laughs> Totally, un we can't go anywhere, you're right. You're, you're in stalemate there. So I was like, what is it that you can do to move out of that? And that's where we think, we start thinking about being kind of on a continuum of learning about and being deeply engaged in really trying to change society and thinking about these issues. So we, we expose them to a continuum, right? A continuum of what we call a liberation continuum. Um, so that they understand also that that feeling of guilt or inaction is actually you know, below the mid-level on a continuum and they have to move further along. So as an instructor, I also have to think about what are the kinds of activities that are gonna get the next, you know, move further along that continuum. So I think 
we have to move from informing to really actually remember the notion of social agency, really creating social agents, right, of change and allies. So it's deeper understanding. So some, some students you'll know will go further beyond or are really uh, way up there in terms of understanding these issues, working across groups, and others are very shy and they will characterize themselves. It's actually a great exercise to do is put them along the continuum and they stand there and then ask each person, how can we move to the next stage? What is it you can do personally? So this is what we do at the end of the dialogue uh, process is we, we, we take them through uh, active listening, uh, stereotype breakdown, and then we take them through a whole uh, area of, of really addressing hot topics. You don't start with a hot topic, you start with these preliminary phases to get to have those conversations. And then the third phase is what we call coalition building. So what is it, and sometimes that's really some of the, the class project at the very end. What can we do on campus as a group or as, uh, what do you suggest that's gonna be? What's gonna be the three things of action you're going to do? So we really try to uh, connect it with what they're doing in their communities on campus, but also to know that each one of them, um, as some students said, my eyes were opened. Now that you have an open eye, your eyes are open, they can't rest and see. They see all the things that we have tried to make invisible, right? So you need to help students with the next set of tools. They need to be kind of that, those active agents. And I think you can do it in the classroom, you can do it as groups, you can do it among peers, and that's very helpful. Hopefully that works. We have a question Hi. back there. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm, I'm Brian Yandel. I'm uh, chair of the STAT department. And you mentioned about STEM earlier, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that and about faculty, because we're seeing an explosion of demand. But are we seeing an explosion of demand in terms of underrepresented minorities, and how can we draw underrepresented minorities into our fields? Uh, are you talking about STEM? Is that what you said? Yes, yeah, STEM. Okay, all right. Yes. <laughs> this is like a nine-year project. <laughs> I just uh, presented uh, at Vision and Change in uh, Washington, D.C., that national meeting, and we actually had some older data that up to 2006 that we're seeing about as many underrepresented students as uh, white and Asian students interested in STEM fields. Now, it, the fields are a little bit different. There are variations in engineering and discipline difference. We're doing some breakdown now. You can go on our website. Um, it, it's the same website, I think, except just slash NIH. You can, you can download just about anything we have, any graph, any paper we presented, and any PowerPoint. But uh, the surprising thing, because we also monitor the higher education research, we're looking at freshmen every single year since 1966. Interest in STEM nationally is the highest it's ever been since, well, since we've been in monitoring students since 1966. Uh, the differences, we're seeing a little bit differences we had seen kind of about the equal rates of URM. There's li slight differences, um, but actually not that that big, and I think the main differences might be within very specific fields. But I'm just, I just have the graphic in my head and I know that that really was out. So it's pretty clear that, yeah, the numbers are increasing, you have more students interested ever before. This is a great window of opportunity for a number of reasons. One, we've got the student interest. Two, guess what? Federal money, NSF, NIH, foundation money is being directed at STEM for institutional change and transformation in teaching and learning and in, in terms of degree attainments. This is probably the best environment ever. Would you agree? This is probably the best environment ever. This is probably the best environment ever we've had for su supporting new innovative programs to make sure we actually uh, uh, achieve the goal of you know, the, the President's Council uh, and Advisors in Science and Technology of producing a million more graduates in STEM. That's the goal, and that's the national goal. They're still gearing up as far as 
you know, I'm not, gonna, I'm not sure what's going to happen in the next election, but let's say the next three years is probably the best environment we've ever had and ruined with an opportunity not only in student interest, but also in having monies available to support innovation in programs and departments and across programs and departments. Hello. Oh, this way. <laughs> okay, there you are. <laughs> so my name is Elisa Torres, and this is, I'm a brand new assistant professor. This is my first semester here. Mm -hmm. This is not my first faculty position, though. And I wanted to comment on um, something that you mentioned in your presentation about the need for more underrepresented faculty. Mm -hmm. And so many of these students that we're trying to reach out to and mentor, um, some of them eventually go on um, to become faculty or staff um, in higher education. And we face the same problems that we did as students. They don't go away and sometimes they get even worse. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, have you considered doing the same type of research that you're doing with recruiting and retaining minority students? Have you also, or are you considering mm -hmm. doing the same type of research with minority faculty? That's a great question. <laughs> because um, we annually, we produce a report on uh, faculty, uh, the Higher Education Research Institute, I'm sorry, it's triannually. And this is this year we actually have a great faculty survey. There is a particular module on STEM. Uh, there's a module for part-time faculty. There's a module for um, climate uh, advising, all kinds of areas, graduate education that we had not covered in the past. So this is a national survey, and we're working with AAU, uh, and also Howard Hughes Medical Institute is really interested also in having most, most of the universities in the country participating this year, because it's the best we've ever had in terms of really monitoring that. So our goal is and has been, we do have a large number, of, well, across the country, of uh, underrepresented faculty that are part of our studies. And what's important about the data is not that just I collected. Everything that we collect in every study that I showed you and did, any campus can do if they participate in the surveys as well. Because all the data is given back to every campus who is a participant. So um, campuses can look at that data, and it gives them a great opportunity. We have put out a few reports on underrepresented faculty. Um, I think, I'm not sure if we did it for, a 20, for 2010, but for this coming year, I mean, when we do the data collection this year, we could produce an, a new one. But the important thing is you can go to those reports, uh, and we've done these since 1978, and they're all online, and you can see the more recent one. All the faculty reports are split by gender. There are separate reports by gender. And their separate reports, the most recent ones, by rank, um, and then and institution type. So you can compare your own institution. The only difficult one is to do the, all the racial differences. And we do have some older reports that has that information. So the information is there. It can be collected. We collect it. We do write on this. Um, some of the, 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 uh, the articles that have been written have been on faculty stress. We have a huge dimension on faculty stress. Our most recent report, uh, we found, for example, that there were, um, there are two things, the, the recent economic, uh, uh, I guess you call it the Great Recession, had a more um, definitive impact on faculty of color. That's pretty clear. So there's a lot of issues, and we talk about harassment, we address all of those issues as areas of stressors for faculty. So. Uh, if you want to know any of the stress uh, dynamics, just go to our website and go to faculty survey research, and you can download the report, the most recent report. Um, so uh, thanks for that question. I think we probably need to do more research on underrepresented faculty, and uh, there's certainly a lot of new initiatives in terms of recruitment and retention. And these data, all of the data I talk about, are designed for institutions to use for improvement and for them to, to study their own students. Another question. Yep, over here. Oh. Um, my name is Marla Delgado Guerrero. I'm a dissertator in the Department of Counseling Psychology. So I'm actually just 
um, want to say first and foremost, I'm a big fan of yours. I'm doing a lot of research. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you. So I'm really excited that our, our university brought you here um, just to, to show the caliber of your work um, and being talk here. So super, super excited you're here. Um, my question is more along the lines of um, mental health and mm -hmm. how is it that um, your research as well as what you're seeing in the dialogues, you mentioned that some of the students are talking a lot about the hurt that they've experienced growing up from infancy through um, their college experiences. So wanting to know a little bit more about um, how it's that you're seeing the um, connection between higher educational experiences and the um, well, uh, psychological well-being. Yeah, that, that's an absolutely important um, connection. Um, a few years ago, uh, we reported um, Basically, I say the Higher Education Research Institute, we don't read the news, we make the news. Because we actually look at all of our data and say, what are the things campuses ought to be concerned with that, about? Emotional health became a real important one, and we have a feature. You can go online and look at our feature in that particular year, because it was one of the things we saw a lot of different indicators in our freshman survey, that there was a, or at least students were reporting much more difficulty uh, issues with uh, emotional health. Again, knowing our students is very key to that, and so the data really told us that. Um, the second thing is when we're, we're doing uh, particularly dialogue, and UCLA was a little nervous campus and going as they say, wanted to do it in a big way. We worked with a counseling center um, and worked with them together in terms of really thinking through the areas where we really needed to refer students or whenever we think that things were um, going to be difficult. And sometimes we do get, um, on occasion, I know that those have done been dialogue for a long time, they'll come back and, you know, you were talking about issues of sexual orientation and suicide and actually this was something that actually happened, you know, um, to a student that's in the dialogue. So you really have to be attentive to those emotional issues and as an instructor, you know, I have to determine at what point I think this is really something that we need. I need to bring in psychological counseling. I need to refer the student, et cetera. But for the most part, students are fairly resilient, even with these hurts. So they will have, um, you know, they will cry, they'll emote or whatever, and then get their act together and say, thank you for letting me tell this, but most of the time, with emotional things, they say, I'm sorry. And I said, don't apologize. We're sorry it happened to you. we sorry these things happened to you. So you really have to kind of turn the tables so where they're not embarrassed to be emotional, but really this is part of a very deep hurt that needs to be taken, may, may need therapy, may need more serious work. Or this is the first time they actually are in a supportive environment where people say, that's okay, that's fine, we understand. Um, and so um, I think uh, there are other organizations. We do monitor emotional health among students at Harry with our surveys, uh, but uh, Gallup has actually had a real focus on well-being also at all stages, and they've been doing quite a bit of work also nationally. So we have a lot more information about students, and the focus on well-being and mental health I think is real key. There was one question yeah. here in the center. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Jennifer Sheridan, and I'm with the Women in Science and Engineering Leadership Institute, oh. which is a little center formed from our NSF Advance Grant. Mm -hmm. So my question brings me back to your initial offer to talk about institutional transformation. Yes. Um, as you may have heard, we are in the process of developing a new diversity plan for our campus, and we have an ad hoc committee um, that is doing this work right now. And you have experience with many, many <laughs> institutions and have seen what might work and what might not. So I'm just hoping you can give us some advice as we start on this new plan. What would you recommend that we pay attention to in the future as we're developing this plan? Okay, can you be more specific about what your plan is? <laughs> well, it's, I, I'm not on this committee, but oh, okay. it's, it's uh, That's a problem, a new, but number one. Right. <laughs> if you're not at the table, you need to get the, to be on the table. Um, it's my understanding, and there are uh, people in this room on the committee developing a new campus diversity plan, everything from students and oh. um, all the way up to faculty, ah. uh, our staff okay. and employee makeup, um, what are we gonna concentrate on and how are we gonna go about 
improving the diversity and climate on this campus for the next 10 years. Oh, okay, so you were talking an overall strategic plan that's for right. diversity. Okay, thank you. I thought thank maybe you. for advance in particular, oh, so oh, that's oh. what I thought. No. <laughs> okay. Bye. Um, Bye. Uh, there, are, uh, there are a lot of models, and uh, but most of the people that have been doing this, they, they come with their great visual and also vision statement, and I think that helps. Uh, not because uh, that that ensures action, but a vision statement helps inspire people to come together to think about uh, that as a goal, and so I think uh, visioning is very important, a vision statement is clear. Um, the other component of the transformation process has really been both top-down and bottom-up. Thinking about how do you address things that are going to set broad goals, they're going to set the policies, that are going to set the programs, that's key, but also how each person is going to contribute and really feel this is part of their, the new culture here. And so for people working at the ground level, what I say, that where the rubber meets the road with students directly, um, very often they'll say, um, you have a lot of people that are, I call them the wait and sees, <laughs> right? The wait and see. Okay, here's another initiative, here's another leader, let's wait and see, right? Okay. So the wait and sees, those are your skeptics. Bring some of those wait and sees in on, on, you know, in, include them. But also they, they've really heard the talk before and they're looking really for action. So there's some members of the community, and I would have to say when you reach deep into the culture of everyday work for, um, as I said, people at the ground level, um, they want to see action. They don't want to see just words. So at the top of the institution or hierarchy, there's a lot of uh, positioning, reputation building, messaging that goes on. You have middle managers, and you think about it. They're conveying that messages to others that report to them, and then you have the wait and see group at the bottom saying, okay, we'll see, we'll, we'll see what happens. So you have to really think about the culture of the organization being broad and specific, and I think what's wonderful is there's so many of you here at all levels of the organization because each one of us plays a role in making, you know, I, I see your goal, uh, uh, excellence inclusive, right? So I think it's a great visioning, and I think uh, uh, Damon Williams set a good example in borrowing and leading other institutions in terms of this. But then realizing that is very key. So, and it reaches all, all, all elements of the institution. So today we were talking about student learning and the educational mission but the priorities of everything from uh, development to research to, uh, again, you know, I think what's wonderful about these institutions is universities are, are intended to, well, do a lot of things, but one is advance social progress in all kinds of ways. And it's wonderful to see that thinking about it, making diversity part of that, uh, advancing social progress and research and teaching and, um, and civic or uh, you know public service uh, being key, and Wisconsin has a long history of public service, so you have it embedded in your mission. Now think about how that works. So um, I see, to me, this is real testimony. The number of people you have, and the historic work that you're doing, and the number of people that are, I think, are now on the same page on these issues. You have the, you have the opportunity to be a national model on how this happens institutional transformation occurs. Um, they have been other institutional models that are quite good, you can learn from, uh, but there's always been sort of an ebb and flow in some of this work. The momentum can slow, so you really need to find new ways and bring in new waves of thinking and ideas and people to make sure that that momentum continues. Well, I wanna thank you because I think that, as I said, I really think you have the opportunity to be a national model and I look forward to seeing what happens with Wisconsin in the future. <laughs>